honor and glory and praise to your name. We pray that you would touch Brother Sharon tonight, give him the words to say. Help us, Lord, to hear the word, receive the word into our heart and into our spirit, anointing every song, every singer, every musician. Let the power of your spirit move mightily upon all the needs tonight. These that are sick and suffering, every name that's been called, all those that are faced with a great adversity, we pray, God, that you would turn their situation around, Lord, that you would bring them out of their despair and their trouble. We know that with your stripes we are healed. We believe tonight for your healing virtue and your delivering power. We give you praise and glory and honor for all these saints. For it's in the lovely name of Jesus Christ we pray and ask it all. Amen and amen. Would you take a moment now and welcome one another to the Matthews Church of God. We're delighted to have you with us tonight.
Time to receive our tithe and offering. 
So it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight and be able to call upon his name. To be in a, a country where you can call on the name of the Lord without being persecuted and, and run off as, one, as of right now today. You know, it's, it seems like it's coming rapidly that it might happen, but we, at this time of time in our lives, Lord, we can, we can uh, worship the Lord in, in the beauty of his holiness. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for all that you do. Lord, you are so wonderful to us. Lord Jesus, you, Lord, prepare, a, Lord, a place for us to worship. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for a home and our family, a roof, a roof over our heads, Lord God, food on our table, Lord God, an opportunity, Lord God, to give back unto you, Lord. Help us, O oh God, to, Lord Jesus, to give that portion, Lord God, that we require of us, Lord God, and help us, O oh God, to give above and beyond. Lord Jesus, that others may be blessed and the church may go forward and hearts and souls may be uplifted and, and saved in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Come on. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? On a cold Wednesday night, where would you rather be? Every time the doors are open, every time the doors are open, it's an opportunity to worship the Lord. And there's nothing better in the world than to worship the Lord. I don't know about you, but after a day like today, this is where I need to be. The lesson today is entitled, Jesus Reveals His Divinity. Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of Man. I hope you could see the projector. Caitlin explained that there was an error where the resolution doesn't come out as well as it is, as it should, but hopefully you could see it. The entire lesson comes from Mark 8.27 through 9.13. And I'm going to have the scriptures up there too if you want to follow along. 
I normally like to teach from the NIV just simply because I understand it a little bit more and it reads a little bit easier for me, but that's me, okay? So bear with me. What we're going to talk about today is Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah. We know from scripture that Peter didn't want to believe that Jesus had to die to fulfill his mission. Peter's confession that Jesus is Lord, Jesus' prediction of his death and his transfiguration were all related events preparing Jesus to complete his works by means of his death, resurrection, and ascension. What we're going to talk about today is usually is believed, is generally believed that this happened about eight months prior to the crucifixion of Jesus. Peter's confession that Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, is often referred to as the great confession, but he wasn't the first to do so. Nathaniel, who was called Bartholomew, made the great confession when he first met Jesus. John 1, 49 tells us, Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And it's really important to, to read that last part, you are the king of Israel. And that, that plays an important role later on down the lesson. We know later on that Peter confessed the same thing too. He said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. We know that in Matthew 16, 16, and in the lesson that we are about to read today. Scripture also tells us that it was always God's plan from the very beginning of creation for his eternal begotten son, Jesus Christ, to become the sacrifice for our sins on the cross and to reconcile us to God. The death of Jesus for our sins was God's first and only plan for our salvation and redemption from sin. There was no plan B. It was his only plan. Revelation 8.13 tells us, the second part of that tells us, the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Genesis 1.26 tells us, let us says the Lord says, let us create man in our image. Let us be in plural, meaning that there always was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. From the, from the time the world was created, God the Father knew that God the Son, the Lamb, would have to be slain for the redemption of sin. We couldn't save ourselves. He had a plan from the time he started this whole thing for us to be saved and reconciled to him. So let's jump into the lesson. Next slide. So it's entitled Peter's Confession. Reading from Mark 8. Uh, uh, oh yeah, it says 28, but it's meant to be 8. Typo. Mark 8, verse 7, Jesus, <laughs> I had this wrong, Mark 8, 27, I put the two in the wrong place, oh my goodness. Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. It's interesting to note a couple things about Caesarea Philippi. It was a city about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus often traveled there for a time of personal renewal and ministering to his disciples, because he knew the disciples would eventually have to carry on his ministry. Although Jesus ministered to thousands of people, he recognized the importance of personal prayer and teaching. Personal prayer meaning one-on-one -on -one time with him and his father, and teaching, passing that down to his disciples is really more interesting to note where this place was. Caesarea Philippi, 25 miles north of the, of the Sea of Galilee, puts it smack in the middle of Samaria. We know the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along. What this proves is who Jesus was. He was Lord not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. Remember the, the woman at the well, where she was? When she recognized who Jesus was, she was a Samaritan. He was in Samaria. Jesus proved by going to Caesarea Philippi that he was not just Lord for Jews, but he was Lord for us too. It's there that Jesus questioned his disciples about who people said he was. 
And their answer revealed three main trains of thought or prominent opinions about who Jesus was up to this point in time. They thought he was the reincarnation of John the Baptist. How in the world could they think that he was the reincarnation of John the Baptist? First of all, that was physically impossible. John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. How could Jesus be the reincarnation of John the Baptist? Well, for one, there's no such thing. But how could they even think that? They thought he was, the second train of thought was that he was the reincarnation of Elijah. Return to earth to reveal the Messiah. Remember, Elisha was supposed to return first to reveal the Messiah. And then they, they thought that he was the reincarnation of what the ancient prophets. They refused to believe or they just couldn't see who he really was. People. People in general. Read on. 8.29. Jesus asked, But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Peter answered, you are the Messiah. It's about time somebody recognized who he was, right? Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. So here's the thing. First, Jesus asked, what do, what do people say I am? And he listened to, to his disciples say what people say he was or who people said he was. Now Jesus flips the question around on the disciples and asks, who do you think I am? Do you follow those people or do you really know me? See, he was asking these people who spent all the time. around, And I can imagine Peter sitting there and he's talking to the 12 and then he says, who do you think I am? See, Peter was the first disciple and he was probably the oldest one too. And by virtue of his position of seniority, he probably assumed a role as spokesperson for both himself and the 12. And he was the one that got up and, say, and said, you are the Messiah. He rightfully identifies and confesses that Jesus is, is the Christ, the Messiah. And central to every version of this reply is the fact that Peter confesses that Jesus was the one foretold by the prophets. That's really important. But Jesus, if, his, if it was so important, why would Jesus tell his disciples right after that? Don't tell anyone who I am. It's important that those who he was with knew who he was, but at that point he told them, don't tell anyone. That's kind of strange. I don't want to tell people, Rick Brackett is the pastor of Matthew's Church of God, right? I want to tell people he's a good preacher. Why, would, why wouldn't Jesus want his disciples? Well, here's the thing. Jesus was the lamb that was meant to be slain from the time of creation. His death, resurrection, and ascension to the right hand of the Father was preordained by God the Father himself. From the time, cre from the time of creation, it was preordained. Jesus told the disciples not to tell anyone about him because he didn't seek out trouble and persecution from his enemies. The time of his death, res resurrection, and ascension to heaven was preordained by God himself, and he wasn't going to do anything to allow, well, nothing could be done that could change that, but he wasn't going to give the enemies a chance to try to die. Because you remember, people wanted to persecute him. People wanted to kill him. They were often trying to trap him. I want to read this from our, our lesson guide. With astounding capacity available today to disperse information and communication via the internet, there has never been a time before now when there was such a concerted effort by the unbelieving world to deny the identity of Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God. In a world that denies the existence of God, there can be no Son of God. But, in fact, God is, and also is his son, Jesus Christ. We who have made and hold to the great confession, that is the confession that Jesus is the Messiah, must depend on the power of the gospel and the conviction of the Holy Spirit to convince others to make the great confession. It's really strange 
that in an unbelieving world, a world that doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, they spend an awful lot of time trying to shut it up. They spend an awful lot of time in the media and in the, on the internet and everywhere else to try to prove to us that God doesn't exist and Jesus, this man, Jesus was just a man in history. One, one thing that is central to every Christian believer is that we must depend on the power of the Holy Spirit to help us convince others to make that same great confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's your job and my job. It's not just his job. Get that? Read on. Verse 31. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Imagine that Peter took the Lord aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus began to teach the 12 about his suffering and his death and his resurrection. And he told them that he would be rejected, killed, and in three days rise again. Just a little while ago, we saw Nathaniel confessing that Jesus was the king of the Jews and the king of Israel. In those days, the Jews thought the Messiah would come riding in on a white horse with a double-edged sword and slay every single Roman soldier there was. They wanted to be rescued from Roman rule and Roman persecution. The Jews thought that the Messiah, to, that, the Messiah that was going to come, that Elijah was going to come before, was going to come and free them from Roman rule and persecution and return them to the superior political position, the former superior political position and power. We know that's not the case. If Nathaniel confessed that Jesus was the king of Israel, then who was this man? If his teachings didn't line up with their, with their popular thought. This led to Peter's rebuking of Jesus, and he wrongfully did so because he just didn't understand. Jesus rightfully identified Peter's attitude and opinion to be that of a worldly point of view, one designed by Satan, Satan himself and perpetuated by man and religious leaders of the time. You all remember religious leaders that Melissa spoke about last week? I remember what Melissa spoke about last week. She spoke about religious leaders. See, Satan is the author of lies. And if he could somehow convince the world that Jesus wasn't who he was, right, that would have been a victory for him. If he could convince the world that this Messiah had to come in riding on a, on a horse with a sword and would slay every Roman soldier, so when Jesus, the Messiah himself, actually came, they wouldn't recognize him. To him, that was a win. But what it showed was exactly what Jesus said. Peter's attitude showed that he was about worldly ambition and power and not things of God. Remember John 3.16? You all remember that? For God so loved the world. It didn't say for God so loved Israel. For God so loved the Jews. The Messiah came to save the world and not just the people around Peter. Peter see, he bought in a little bit to the common thought that the Messiah would come and rid them of the Roman soldiers. That was the worldly ambition and power, return a Jewish power, and not the things of God. God's concern was with all mankind. All mankind. That included you and me, not just the Jews. Moving on. Verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For, wh for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? We know the King James Version of that really well. What profit a man 
to gain the whole world but lose his soul. Verse 37 says, Or what can anyone give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory, in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Jesus called the people and the twelve and he taught them about discipleship. What he was about to say was linked to his approaching death, was directly linked to his approaching death, although he had not yet revealed how he would die. He told them, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross. So in these times, the cross was what the Romans sold it, or the Romans used to execute criminals and dissidents. We know the story. They knew it. They knew what would happen too. If you had to take up your cross and you had to carry it, more than likely, you're going to die on it. That's just what they did. They would have the criminals carry their cross up a hill, put it in the ground, and nail them to it. Nail them to it and lift it up and put it in the ground. Jesus was telling the people and the 12 that he was talking to, his 12, that if, you won't, if you're going to follow him, you've got to be willing to die. You've got to be willing to pick up that cross and you've got to be willing to carry it. And the end of that cross we know is death. They didn't understand that he wasn't talking of physical death. It could have been a physical death, but it, it was more of a representational death, and we know what that is. This represents the highest levels of commitment that it takes to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and it testifies to the fact that he is the Messiah. If it takes everything that we have, all life, that is the highest level of commitment you could have to any cause. That's why they call it martyrdom, right? When people go give themselves and blow themselves up and all these crazy things, they're that committed to our cause. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to be totally in. You've got to be fully committed. He said that we must be willing to lose our lives for his sake in order to save our lives. See, that thing up there is a, is a baptistry. And when we go in that, when we, when we get baptized and we go down in the water and we come up, it represents the drowning of the old man. And the rebirth of the new man. We must be willing to lose our lives in order to save it when we follow Christ. In other words, we must give up the things of this world. The life that Christ has in store for us is infinitely better than anything we can create for ourselves. I don't know how we could create a heaven. And how we could create a a world with no disease and no sickness and no pain, no sorrow. But that's the kind of world that he has in store for us. That's the reward. See, if we don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah and we don't completely submit to him, we can have everything this world here has to offer. <laughs> but we'll have nothing at the end. Can you imagine that? I can't imagine heaven. I could, I could try, but I can't imagine. Whew, it's powerful. Salvation is found in being identified with Christ in this sin-cursed world. And if we identify with Christ, that means we don't identify with the world. That means if we identify with him, we lose the things of this world. I would rather lose the things of this world than lose my soul any day. Hear that? I would rather lose the things of this world than to lose my soul any day. And that's why he came, so we didn't have to lose our souls. Tempted to get ahead of myself. The rewards for following Christ are the b at best and they're eternal. That means we could never lose them once we follow him. He never issues a, a call to easy discipleship. See, although he promises life everlasting and he promises us this eternal life where there's no sickness, no pain, no sorrow, none of the bad things in this world, it's not an easy life to discipleship, right? 
Although salvation is free and was paid for in blood by Jesus, Christian discipleship requires much. It, requir it requires the complete commitment and surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior. What does that mean, complete surrender? It means taking up that cross, dying to the world. It means following his, it means following his word, following his teaching each and every day. We humans, right? So we're going to fail. But that's not an excuse to fail. Somebody, somebody got to say amen or something to that one. It's not an excuse to fail. The blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross is not your and my excuse to go do everything that is stupid under the sun. Because he promised us that if we believe in him, that we would have life everlasting, that don't mean we have the right to God and abuse it. Because every time we do, guess what? We bang those nails right back into his hand. Getting ahead of myself. Chapter 9, verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Skipping down to verse 7. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Pay attention to that last one. Listen to him. If we're going to talk about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, we need to understand what transfigure is, right? The word transfigure comes from two Latin or, or Greek words, trans and figura, meaning to, to change form. Transfigure means to be made or transformed into something more beautiful or elevated. How in the world could you, tr could you transform the son of the living God into something more beautiful or more elevated? The trans and that just goes to prove who Jesus was, right? The transfiguration of Jesus was confirmation of the great confession. That is, the transfiguration of Jesus. Jesus was, is the son of the living God. Peter made the confession that Jesus is Lord, his transfiguration, meaning that he could become something even more than he already was, was proof who Peter says he was. While on top of the mountain, the three apostles saw Jesus transfig transfigured and made into something more beautiful. His clothes and his hair and his skin began to shine and they became radiant white. Now something like, almost that like you couldn't look upon. It was so bright, so wonderful. And then appeared Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Luke 9, 30 and 31 tells us what they were talking about. It says, two men, Moses and, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. The King James Version replaces the word fulfillment with accomplishment. An accomplishment is something you work towards, right? You work towards a goal. Something, I mean, the word defines itself, but something that you try to achieve. The very thing that they were talking about is the very thing that Peter had objected to and described it. And they, this is Elijah and Moses, described it as an accomplishment or fulfillment that was about to happen. They told you the where and they told you the what, the accomplishment. We know what that accomplishment was. That accomplishment was the crucifixion of Jesus on the Christ and the shedding of his blood. Not just the crucifixion, the death of Jesus Christ, right? Because the story doesn't end there. We know that. It was his resurrection and then his ascension. The whole scene became shrouded in a cloud and God spoke in an, in an audible voice confirming to the three disciples that the, Jesus was indeed his son and they should listen to him. They should listen to him. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law, but he came to fulfill the law and the prophecies that foretold of his coming. 
He came to fulfill the role. His authority as the Son of God superseded the law. In the past, through the prophets, God spoke through the prophets. They put pen to paper and wrote the word down. But we know that the word was God and the word was with God and then the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. In the past, God spoke through the prophets, but now he spoke by his son, Jesus Christ, who was there at that point in time. Do you see what I'm saying? The word became flesh. He spoke the word through his prophets in the Old Testament, but now this new covenant was by his son, Jesus Christ, being actually there. And he told the disciples to listen to him. Guess what? He's telling us to listen to him too. When you read your Bible, I like to read my Bible on an electronic device that is just easy for me to carry around. Doesn't matter. How does Jesus' word appear? In red letters, right? It's for us to pay particular attention. It's not by happenstance that he said, this is my son, listen to him. That's why the words are in red letters. Not just so that we would know that Jesus was speaking these words, so that we would pay particular attention to what he was speaking. So that we would listen. Not just hear, but listen. Not just listen, but heed. I'm almost finished, I promise. The Transfiguration, continuing uh, chapter 9, verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. So Jesus commanded the three that were with him, as Peter, James, and John, not to tell anyone about his transfiguration and what they saw until after he was risen from the dead. Now you got to remember, these were the men that were with Jesus, and they saw miracles happen. But yet they were a little bit confused about risen from the dead, or rising from the dead. So they started a discussion, what does it mean when he says, when he says until he's risen from the dead. And this led to another discussion about Elijah and the fact that he would come as a preparatory for Jesus being revealed. A preparatory meaning someone who paves the way, someone who leads or, or a forerunner to, to, to someone or something. In this case, Jesus is coming. They mistakenly interpret this literally. They thought they were going to see the man Elijah coming down, preparing the way for Jesus. Isaiah 43 tells us, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Malachi 3.1 also tells us, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of, of the covenant, whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. They didn't realize that Elijah had already come, figuratively, in the form of John the Baptist, who paved the way for Jesus Christ to be revealed. Jesus' command to his disciples to not say anything about his transfiguration might have been the same as before. The fact that God preordained the time, the way, the place, and everything for Jesus to die rise again, and ascend to heaven. Jesus knew his enemies were out to entrap him, and nothing, nothing could stop the preordained destiny that he had to fulfill, that accomplishment that he had to, to fulfill. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, his death, resurrection, and ascension was pertaining, was preordained by God to happen at a particular time. I'm almost finished. 
I'm going to read this one more lesson. It is important to remember that Christ's desire for his disciples was that they would come, a, come to know the truth regarding his divine identity. And yet the means by which that was to be accomplished was a process. A process. So also within our own lives, we must understand that seeking greater intellectual and exper experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ is a process that will continue for guess how long? For the rest of our lives. Meaning you don't just become a Christian and follow Jesus here. You get baptized, you say, I believe in the Lord, and you're done. It continues for the rest of your life. This one, once saved, always saved, one and done thing, that's a fallacy, right? Because you're supposed to follow him every day of your life. After more than 20 years as a believer in Christ, the apostle, the apostle Paul's ambition regarding Christ was from Philippians 3.10, was that I may know him. And the Apostle Peter's last exhortation to his fellow Christians, and that is us, was to grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter, the last thing he said was for us to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That means each and every day get to know him a little bit better. That means like your best friend, get to know him a little bit better. That means like your wife or husband that you live with every day, that you learn a little bit more every day until death do us part. You get to know him that way each and every day. Christ calls us to come and follow him to death itself and to receive life that can come only from a sincere commitment to him. This thing, this thing that we call the Christian walk is a commitment to Christ that lasts a lifetime. I am so glad that he came to this earth, that he gave us the word, and he gave us our promise that he's coming again, right? And if we believe the things written in the word, which I do, I know the time is soon. I thank you for your attention, Pastor. I thank you for the opportunity to do this. God bless you all. our musicians and singers if they will to come i appreciate the word tonight don't you i'm glad to know he is jesus christ the son of god praise the lord no doubt about it simon peter said it emphatically and jesus said the reason he knew that he was the son of god was because the father had revealed it to him from heaven aren't you glad you've had that revelation god has opened our eyes to see the truth and the truth has set us free we're here tonight because we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Would you stand and I want us to get ready to pray. So many needs to pray about, but praying especially for one another. These are the last days. Our lesson next week is about the end times. We're seeing it unfold and fulfilled right before our eyes. We are, we are so near home until it's un, unbelievable that so many people are unprepared and not even looking for the Lord to come. We should be ready, watching, and praying, and I know he is coming soon. Would you come tonight, if you possibly can, and find a place to pray? Pray for one another. Pray for the lost. Pray that God will help us to win them. If you can't come, pray right where you are.
Sanctuary.